Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his powerful acts. Praise him for his abundant greatness. Praise him with the blast of a ram's horn. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Father God, we, we thank you for being a God who, who speaks to us through your word and for being a God who gives us mouths to sing your praises, to lift our voices on high, to offer prayers of thanksgiving, to proclaim the greatness of the one who's called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We come this morning to give you thanks for all that you are and all that you've done. Would you inhabit the praises of your people, we pray, as we come before you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, you stand with us and turn your spiral bound books to number 137. Number 137 in your spiral bound books. in those same books. Let's sing Hail to the Lord's Anointed. His reign on earth be. 
Turn to number 154 in, the, in your books, The Blessing. How many of you knew you were prayed for at some time in your life? Oh, I love it. He's a little higher. You know what? That's, that's the covenant of the Lord going down from generation to generation. I, um, my, my parents were married in 1970, and I was born in 1972. And my great-grandma, who loved the Lord so much, um, passed away right before I was born. And so, but... Right by her bedside are, were these worn floorboards of a niece that hit the ground every morning to pray for me. And I didn't even know who she was. I didn't even know. But if you had, didn't have that in your family, if you didn't have that, guess what? You can start the generations in your family right now. And I love this song because the faithfulness of God goes from generation to generation. I love our church because we have old Grammys and Grampies and brand new babies. And that just shows that the faithfulness of God is going out to the next generation. And so we're thankful for all of our babies. I love their loud noises. I love when they're singing with us. It's great. It's amazing because they've learned that praise the Lord with your voice and your lips and your time together is sending the Lord's story on to the next generation. So let's sing that today. This is the blessing.
been so good to us. You've blessed us with mouths with which we can praise you, but with which we can also curse those made in your image. You've given us hands that we can lift up and worship to you, that we can use to build and to hug and to work and to shape, and with which we can also do harm. You've given us eyes with which we can behold your wonders and the beauty that you've surrounded us with and with which we can also use to gaze upon iniquity and filth. Lord, all too often we have failed to steward well what you've entrusted to our care. Forgive us. Forgive us when we take your good blessings and use them for selfishness rather than service for wickedness rather than worship. We've sinned against you in thought and in word and in deed and in our affections. Would you now, by your spirit, show us our sin that we might repent and know the forgiveness that you've, you offer for us in Christ. Forgive what we've done 
and what we've left undone. Have mercy on us for Christ's sake as we confess our sin before you now. Lord, we thank you and rejoice over the assurance of pardon that you give us in your word. Where it is written, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Thanks be to God. Amen. Uh, we're going to continue our time of worship now by transitioning to our hymnal. So if you turn to number 302 in your hymnals, number 302. We're going to continue um, our time of worship this morning by bringing our petitions before the Lord. I, I know there are things weighing heavy on many hearts this morning, and so let's, um, let's corporately bring them before the Lord this morning. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we, we rejoice and are glad that you have gathered us once again here in this place with one another to worship you, uh, to, to, to give you praise with our lips, to, to offer up prayers before you, knowing that our prayers are heard because of, 
our, our great high priest, Jesus Christ, who sits at your right hand and is even now making intercession for us. Lord, we, um, we come asking for good gifts from our heavenly father uh, because we're dependent on you. Lord, we, we, we pray for your church here at Tribuco Canyon that we would be a faithful representation of your bride, that you would be glorified not just in what takes place here in this building for the few hours on Sunday morning, but what takes place in our lives each and every day. We, we think of those who, who are sick or, or injured, who, who can't be with us this morning. Lord, we, we pray for healing for them. We pray for strength for, for the weak and for bad backs and for bad eyes and arthritis and cancers. We pray especially for Hockey Webb that you'd heal her colitis and return her home from the hospital and, and mend her broken ankle. We pray for those who are here this morning who are mourning. Would you give them comfort? We pray for the families that are represented here that you would, Lord, build them up, that marriages would be strengthened, that children would joyfully obey their parents. Lord, that parents wouldn't exasperate their children. We pray that you'd provide for your people, especially those who are unemployed or underemployed. And Lord, our, our hearts are heavy for the lost. Those we know and love who don't yet know you as they ought. Would you rescue the perishing? Would you hear these and all of our prayers for Christ's sake as we bring them before you now? Lord, we pray for our nation. It's hard to know where to start. In the preamble to our Constitution, it tells us that we were endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. And while we, as this nation's citizens, are always eager to insist on our rights, it seems that in so much of our lives we've abandoned our Creator who gave us those rights. Forgive us. Forgive us for, in so many ways, forsaking you, the one true God. Forgive us for a love of self that is greater than love of you and neighbor. Forgive us for calling evil good and good evil. Forgive us when we've forsaken and abandoned your law and your wisdom and replaced it with unjust and self-serving laws. Forgive us when we place our ultimate hope in kingdoms that are passing away rather than in the king of kings. Forgive us for failing to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly before you. Would you in your grace and mercy bring about a great spiritual awakening in our land in which you gather great multitudes for yourself? Would you grant repentance and faith and Lord, as we approach our national elections in November, we pray, we pray for godly and wise leaders that are better than we deserve, who would use their offices to serve you and this people rather than serve themselves. Where there's corruption, would you root it out? Where there's wickedness, would you expose it? Where there's lies and deceit, would truth prevail? You tell us in your word to pray for those in authority over us. So, Lord, we lift up 
our president and vice president, our congressmen, our senators, our governors, would you humble them before you, the true and living God, that they might govern us wisely? You tell us in your word, the fear of the Lord is beginning of, the beginning of wisdom. And I see such a lack of fear among those who are governing us, a lack of fear of who you are. So give us godly leaders who would seek you and honor you with their lives and with their laws. And this morning we pray especially for President Trump. We thank you for your protection and sparing his life yesterday. Would you, would you preserve him from further assaults? Lord, we, we want to have just and true and fair elections where candidates are assassinated mere months before they might be elected. And Lord, we pray especially for the man who was killed in the crossfire yesterday and for those in critical care this morning. Would you bring comfort and healing? And would you help us to always be pr praying as you taught us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A um, couple quick announcements before we dismiss kids off to Sunday school. Do you want to share a little bit about VBS? You're good. Um, I'll share a little bit about VBS. You should have in your uh, bulletin a flyer for Vacation Bible School. Some of you are like, I'm too old for Vacation Bible School. Yeah, I, I, I get that. But what you can do is you can actually give this away. Or maybe if you're really tech savvy, you could take a couple pictures of it and text it to people who you know who might have kids uh, who are kind of K through sixth grade. Uh, we'd love to have them. This is our biggest outreach of the year. And, and thanks in advance for all of those who, of you who are going to help. And, uh, and, and you can start helping by inviting kids. Uh, if, if you want posters, we even have posters that you can put up at your swimming pool. Maybe you own a, maybe you own a, a business and you want to put, maybe you own a donut shop and you want to put it in the donut shop window. If you own a donut shop, come see me because we're, 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 we're willing to heavily invest in donuts. Or, or you might know the owner of a donut shop and, and you can put that up in, in, in their window. But, but yeah, uh, bye. Bye, Maya. Uh, the rest of you can take your Bibles and open them to Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you, you're welcome to use one of the pew Bibles that should be in front of you. Luke chapter 11. And we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 11, verse 14 through verse 28. If you're able... Will you stand for the reading of God's holy word? Oh, I'm in John chapter 11. That's not the right patch. There we go. Luke chapter 11. Much better. Hear the word of the Lord. Now he was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon came out, the man who had been mute spoke and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, he drives out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. And others, as a test, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. Knowing their thoughts, he told them, every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction. And a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say, I drive out demons by Beelzebub. And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons drive them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. If I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his 
estate, his possessions are secure. But when one stronger than he attacks and overpowers him, he takes from him all his weapons he trusts in and divides up his plunder. Anyone who is not with me is against me. And anyone who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit comes out of a person, it roams through waterless places looking for rest and not finding rest. It says, I'll go back to my house that I came from and returning, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself and they enter and settle down there. As a result, that person's last condition is worse than the first. As he was saying these things, a woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. He said, rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. This is God's word. You may be seated. So we have an episode that's taking place here of a man who's possessed by a demon. And apparently this, this demon had control over the man, so he was mute. He, he could not talk. Now, before we go any further, some of you are going to say, demon possession? Really, Pastor Robert? Yeah, really. Well, you might say, but, but Pastor Robert, maybe, maybe it was some kind of sickness and they just didn't know what it was and, and they called it demon possession. No, and, and in fact, we know that Luke is a, a medical doctor and throughout the Gospel of Luke, he's careful to differentiate between sickness and injury and demonic possession. Luke knew the difference and so did Jesus. At the core of the Christian faith is a belief in the supernatural. It's essential to understanding the world in which we live and to understanding the gospel. The Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, m- many of you know it well. Our, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. So at its core, the Christian faith is a supernatural faith. In fact, one of the reasons Jesus came to this earth was not just to be a moral example for us. It's to redeem us and fill us with his spirit so that he could reside in us and be with us and mold us and shape us into the likeness of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. In, in fact, last week's message, we were talking about prayer and persisting in prayer, and, and we talked about um, If earthly fathers who are evil delight in giving good gifts to their earthly children, how much more will our heavenly father who is good delight in giving his Holy Spirit to his children? So last week's message was in part about God giving us the good, good gift of his Holy Spirit. And I think Luke is arranging this portion of the gospel to get us thinking along along these lines. And he's presenting this demon as a foil or a contrast to the Holy Spirit. He, he wants us to see God gives the Holy Spirit. Satan sends demonic spirits. Again, the Christian faith is not just a moralistic philosophy. It's not just that we think we've got better rules than the Hindus or the Muslims. Christianity starts out with the truth that we are in and of ourselves spiritually inadequate and broken. There is no one righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And and the way to remedy this sin issue is not simply by doing better to obey the rules, better moral reform, picking yourself up by your bootstraps. No. The way to have our sins dealt with is to have them dealt with on the cross of Christ. As we just sang, this is all my hope and peace. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus becomes a substitute sacrifice for us. When When we place our trust in him, he assuages God's wrath. He atones for our sin. He gives us his goodness and his righteousness. And he gives us his Holy Spirit to dwell within us so that we might live through him and be transformed more and more into his image. 
That's at the core of the Christian faith. And so it stands to reason if the Holy Spirit is sent to transform and shape us, there are other kinds of spirits that seek to transform and shape and wreak havoc. It's those demons that are referenced here. How should we think about demonic powers? Um, Real quick, one of my favorite quotes, I'm sure you've heard it from my lips before. It's from C.S. Lewis. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the the demons or the devils. One is to disbelieve their existence. The other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They, the demons themselves, are equally pleased by both errors and hail the materialist or the magician with the same delight. So we're we're not to be ignorant about demons, but we're not to obsess about demons either. Uh, Again, um, this is woven all throughout the the New Testament, the spiritual battle we engage in. In in fact, in the book of Ephesians, uh, one of the things Paul's insistent about is the superior superior power of Jesus above, above all other forces in heaven on earth. I um, uh, studied about this a lot in seminary uh, under, under Clint Arnold. He, he wrote a famous, well, it's not really famous, famous, but uh, <laughs> a, a famous commentary, if you would, uh, as, as famous as commentaries can get, called Ephesians Power and Magic. And, and it delved into all the um, archaeological discoveries that have been found in Ephesus, how there was all this syncretism where you had people in the church invoking angels and uh, looking to spirits and spiritual powers to protect them and prosper them. And, And in the culture, they were very superstitious. They were very focused on the supernatural. Uh, so, so people would, would go up and, and, and pay money to get curses sent on their enemies, things like this. And one of the things the Apostle Paul is emphatic about showing in the book of Ephesians is how Jesus is more powerful than all these other forces, than demons, than spells, than charms, than incantations. In fact, he highlights that in Ephesians uh, when he writes... God exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but in the one to come. So when it comes to demonics, demonic forces and devils, on the one hand, remember, don't obsess about them, don't ignore them, but also on the other hand, remember, Jesus is greater Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, Jesus is greater. Now, let's get back to Luke. Luke chapter 11, verse 14. Now, he, Jesus, was driving out a demon that was mute. And when the demon came out, the man who had been mute spoke. And the crowds were amazed. But some of them said he drives out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. So here you have a mute man who's possessed in a really bad way. He he can't even speak. And Jesus heals him. He frees him from this demonic possession and, and the man speaks. Just, just, just imagine, Jesus has just been talking about the importance of prayer and how to pray. And this man couldn't pray out loud before. And now he, his tongue is loosed and he can cry out to God in prayer. He can sing praises to God. He is free. He can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. If, if you walked in this morning, hopefully, if you, could, if you understood English, you'd sing along with us, right? Jesus has just been talking to his disciples about the importance of prayer and talking to your Father in heaven. And the first miracle that he performs after talking about prayer is freeing this man to speak. But rather than rejoicing over this miracle, some people in the crowd, in particular Matthew tells us, the Pharisees accuse Jesus of performing this miracle by the power of Satan. Now notice, there's no disputing whether a miracle took place or not. 
The dispute is where the power for the miracle came from. And rather than using their tongues to rejoice over what God has done in delivering this man, these Pharisees use their tongues to twist the truth and accuse Jesus of performing a miracle by the power of Satan. They're, they're attributing to the devil the wonder-working power of God. This freed man has a loose tongue, but these Pharisees are using their twisted tongues to blaspheme. Jesus performs a miracle. And the Pharisees try to answer the question, how did he do it? And according to them, he did it through the power, by the power of Satan. Listen to what uh, Kent Hughes writes. He says, describing this episode, he says, God's finger was touching them. God was speaking to them. What they had just witnessed was a direct, unambiguous demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Now they must make life's ultimate judgment. And they were at the point of making a decision which once deliberately made would be irreversible and would make deliverance forever impossible. Reject the Holy Spirit. Call ultimate good evil. Call truth itself a lie. And God himself has no fur further evidence left. Nothing further left to say. God himself is reduced to silence. They were tottering on the edge of an eternity of judgment, but mercifully, Jesus would not let them go without explaining to them exactly what they were doing. He was not going to let them suppose that, the, that reason was on their side. He was going to show them that to reject him, they would have to shelve their religious sensibilities and common sense and knowingly and deliberately, they must call black that which in every other context and circumstance of life, they would have called white. Do you see the irony in this passage? Here you have this man who can't speak who Jesus looses his tongue. And you hear, here you have these other men, these Pharisees, who are supposed to be God's representatives, but rather than praising God for his miraculous wonders, they're blaspheming. In the beginning of this passage, we see this pathetic figure who Christ delivers and rescues. Contrast that man with this group of men who are looked to by the world in which they live in for their insights and for their understanding of God. And they use their perfectly good mouths to blaspheme what God is doing. They would have been better off being mute. They had eyes to see what was plain as day in front of them, but they chose to be blind to the light of the world. Jesus sees what's going on. And look at what he says in verse 17. Knowing their thoughts, he told them, every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction. And if a house divided against itself falls, if, if Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For, I say, for you say, I drive out demons by Beelzebub. And if I drive out demons by, by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons drive them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. In, in other words, Jesus is saying, Satan doesn't destroy his own work. To, to, to put it in a sports analogy, imagine I'm a quarterback, okay? Imagine Brian is playing for the other team and Brian's rushing me, so... Three, two, one, hike. I step back. Brian's coming toward me. Do I hand the ball off to Brian? No. I don't do that. I'd be fired or replaced or had my head examined. No, of course not. Divided houses don't stand. Listen to how Peterson, Peterson paraphrases these verses. He, he writes, Jesus knew what they were thinking and said, any country in civil war for very long is wasted. A constant squabbling family falls to pieces. 
If Satan cancels Satan, is there any Satan left? You accuse me of ganging up with the devil, the prince of demons to cast out demons. But if you're slinging devil mud at me, calling me a devil who kicks out devils, doesn't that same mud stick on your own exorcists? But if it's God's finger I'm pointing that sends the demons their way, then God's kingdom is here for sure. You, you, you see, Jesus has come to clean house. He's, he's come to set captives free. He's come to deliver and redeem his people, right? If, if, you, if you come home after a vacation and you left your house a mess and you open the door to your house and the house has been cleaned, you don't say, oh my gosh, we've been robbed, Right? You, you wonder, who's, who's done this? What, what kind friend or neighbor has come and, and cleaned up our house? I hope I didn't leave my dirty underwear out, right? You know, yeah, you, you don't think you've been robbed. Friends, Jesus comes to deliver and to clean house. Now, there's some of you who are here this morning who you might identify with this man whom Jesus has set free. You identify with the bondage he's in? Maybe there's a battle going on in your soul right now. Maybe, maybe there's a besetting sin that you've almost given up fighting. Maybe it's malice or lust or laziness or greed or sinful pride or a lying tongue. Is is there something other than Jesus that's governing your life? Maybe you're wondering if you can ever really be free. Are you a house divided? Friends, I, I believe God's word and I have no doubt that Jesus who did these miraculous deliverances by the power of the Holy Spirit, his spirit can deliver today. He can, he can clean up what's going on inside. He can bring order to the chaos. He can bring healing to the brokenness. All throughout Luke's gospel, one of the things we've been seeing is that, that Jesus is king and he comes with a kingdom of spiritual power. He, Jesus doesn't just come to be your friend or your counselor, he, he comes to be your king. And, and in fact, we see this theme echoed all throughout Luke's gospel. We've, we've already seen it, right? Um, in Luke one thirty three, the angel's word to Mary. Now listen, you'll conceive and give birth to a son and you'll name him Jesus. He'll be great and called the son of the most high God. Uh, the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. In Luke 4, 43, Jesus is burdened to preach the kingdom. When it was day, he went out and made his way to a deserted place, but the crowds were searching for him. They came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them, but he said to them, it's necessary for me to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns because I was sent for this purpose. Jesus sends his disciples out as ambassadors of his kingdom. Luke chapter 9, summoning the 12, he gave them power and authority over all the demons to heal and to heal diseases. And he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. We've seen all throughout Luke's gospel, Jesus' kingly authority over nature, over sickness, over death, over leprosy, over demons. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come. And here we see in this episode yet another sign that Jesus is God's king. Verse 20, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now this language of the finger of God, it shows up in the Old Testament. I just want to highlight a couple places it does. I'm, I'm not going to have you turn there. If, if you want to take notes, I'll, I'll point them out to where they are. But first, First is Exodus chapter 8, verse, verse 9. Um, I'm actually probably going to start in verse 16. Exodus chapter 8, verse 16, where it's, it's part of the Exodus story, where, where God is delivering his people out of Egypt. We read in chapter 8, verse 16, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, 
stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the land and it will become gnats throughout the land of Egypt. And they did this. Aaron stretched out his hand and his staff and when he struck the dust of the land, gnats were on people and animals. All the dust of the land became gnats throughout the land of Egypt. The magicians tried to produce gnats using their occult practices, but they could not. The gnats remained on people and animals. This is the finger of God, the magician said to Pharaoh. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen to them as the Lord said. So this, this first reference to the finger of God is about God's mighty power, his miraculous power. And isn't that what accompanied Jesus' ministry over and over again? We, we, we've already seen through Luke's gospel, miracle after miracle after miracle. And the other place the finger of God language is used in the Old Testament that I want to point to is, is not to his miraculous power, but to actually his communicating power or his speaking power. Exodus 31, 18, when he had finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him two tablets of testimony, stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. So, so this finger of God language in Exodus points, in Exodus 31, is pointing to the way in which God communicates to his speak, speaking, the, to his people, the way he reveals himself to his people. And friends, when Jesus speaks, he's showing us the Father. Jesus delivers by the power of the Spirit of God and is bringing his kingdom. And he wants to bring about his rule in our life. And how does he does that? How does he do that? Well, first, there's this miraculous component to it, but then there's also this communicative component to us. He, he communicates with us. He's given his word. These not, might not be tablets written by the actual finger of God, but we know what God said through his word. Now, the idea of God wanting to rule you might sound scary. It might sound a little esoteric. Let me put it this way. He wants all of you. Well, I, 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 and I mean that both ways. He wants all of you, every single one of you, but he wants all of each individual of you as well. Um, there are times when I've said to my wife, I love you with my whole heart. And she smiles. She might even give me a kiss. I wonder how it would go if I went up to her and said, I love you with like three quarters of my heart. I don't know. Not going to try it. Okay. Maybe if some of you adventure some husbands out there want to try, let me know how it goes. I, I, I don't think it'll go well. But, but, but this, is, this is the idea. We are to be spirit filled. He wants all of us. He wants the whole house. Now, now, some of you might say, I, I can't obey Christ perfectly. That's too much for me. Exactly. You can't. If all you needed was to obey and that's all you needed, you wouldn't need his spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to do a work in us, to, to renew us, to transform us, to reorient our desires and our affections and to make us more like Christ. And so now Jesus changes the picture to describe what he's doing in his ministry in verse 21. Look, he's, this, we have this new picture of a strong man. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his estate, his possessions are secure. Okay, so, so just so we're all tracking, this strong man here is the devil. But when one stronger than he attacks, which is what Jesus is doing, he overpowers him and he takes from him all his weapons he trusted in. I, I think those weapons that Satan is trusting in are his demons and his minions. And he divides up his plunder. So I, I think that's a picture of what's going on with this man. This man was in possession by Satan and Jesus is freeing this man. Verse 23, anyone who is not with me is against me. And anyone who does not gather with me scatters. Jesus 
is gathering a people to be united in his spirit. Again, verse 23, anyone who is not with me is against me. You can't be agnostic about Jesus. He doesn't give us that option. In this war that's raging, you need to pick sides. You don't get to be Switzerland. Are you with God? Because if you're not, you're against him. And friend, today is as good a day as any to pick sides. You, you might have come this morning to church. You might uh, not be hostile to the things of God. You might just be ambivalent. You're like, oh, it's cool. I'm, you know, will you take me out to breakfast, mom? Or afterwards? Or I, I, I don't know who brought you. Maybe it's your mom. Maybe it's your dad. Maybe it's a spouse or a girlfriend or boyfriend. And, but but, but you're here and, and you're really already thinking about what you're going to have for lunch. And friend, there are things that are far more important than lunch that are being talked about right now. If you're not for him, you're against him. But Jesus says he's gathering a people to himself who will be with him. Are, are you with him today? You can be. You, you, can, you can be with Jesus. I, I, and here's what I mean. Uh, there's, there's been great debate in... Uh, this week all throughout presidential po politics and, and I, I think any of you have been watching CNN have known that there's a big discussion in the Democratic Party right now whether or not um, Joe Biden should be the, the nominee for, for president for the Democratic Party. And I, I watched one interview, I think it was with Chuck Schumer who, who got up and said, I'm with Joe. They kept asking questions. I'm with Joe. Kept asking questions. I'm with Joe, right? He was, he was declaring his allegiance to our current president. Friends, have, have you declared your allegiance to Jesus? Are you with Jesus? Do you, do you have a confidence that he is with you in your coming and your going? What was it we... we, we Where's that song? The blessing, right? We, we just sang it, right? We just sang it earlier. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you. In the morning, in the evening, and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. He is for you. Some of you here this morning are listening to my voice might say, but but I don't know that Jesus would want to be with me. You, you don't know what I've done. You don't know my sin. Friends, the good news of the gospel is, well, let me start with the bad news. The bad news of the gospel is that, that you're actually more sinful than you realize. But the good news of the gospel is God's more gracious and merciful than you ever hoped. Jesus is eager to forgive your sin. He is eager to plunder you out of the grips of the strong man and set you free. And not only set you free, but bring you into the family of God and give you his spirit and make you a new creation. Look at verse 24 with me. When, when an unclean spirit comes out of a person, it roams throughout waterless places looking for rest and not finding any rest. It then says, I'll go back to my house that I came from and returning it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself and they enter and settle down there. And as a result, that person's last condition 
is worse than the first. When we read this, we, we might ask, why does Jesus jump from an evil spirit going out of a person to going back into a house? I, I think it might be because spirits think of humans as places where they abide. So I'm, I'm going to use this home language. We're, we're going to talk, we, we talked about this divided house. Uh, now we're going to talk about a clean house and then a blessed house. Um, Dale Bruner writes, Neutrality toward Jesus is an empty house. Unemotional belief in Jesus is merely is a merely swept but unoccupied home. Mere interest in Jesus with no commitment to him is a house in danger of haunting. For our own good, therefore, Jesus summons us to fill the house, to join the church and take her worship services seriously, to appropriate and be filled with the Holy Spirit given to us in baptism, and to become Jesus' disciple in the world of our work. For our empty, swept, tidy house will be filled sooner or later by something, because houses are to be lived in. The question is not, will I become all involved? The question is not, will I become all involved or not? It is, with what will I become all involved? For life is a series of total involvements, whether we like it or not. And Jesus is trying to save us from demonic, obsessive, bourgeois involvements that bring us into the little community of saints, the fellowship of disciples, and the church and our mission. Again, we are to be filled with the Spirit, not half filled with the Spirit. I, um, I have a gift for you this morning. I think most of you already got it. There's a, it's a great little book. It's called My Heart, Christ's Home. And I think all of you adults here this morning got one when you came in. It's, uh, it's written by Robert Boyd, Boyd Munger. Um, and uh, it's a great little book. Uh, it's, it's a whopping 16 pages. And it's not like even full pages. It's like half pages, right? So this is, this is light work. So, so this is your homework. Uh, I want you to read this this week. Um, we're going to sing probably something a little bit about something along these lines at church next Sunday. But, but the idea is Robert uses this picture of our heart as homes. And like in our earthly homes, we have different rooms, right? We've got studies, we've got kitchens, we've got bedrooms, we've got living rooms, we've got rec rooms. Now, I, I, I know oftentimes when we have guests over, we wanna just make sure like the downstairs is clean. We don't worry so much about the bedrooms because we don't think people are gonna be going up into the bedrooms. But imagine Christ's come, Christ comes into your home and he wants to have a look around. Are, are there rooms in, the, in your heart that you don't want them see? And that's really what, what this book is about. And, and so I want to encourage you, um, fill your whole heart with the Spirit and make your heart his home. We talked about a clean house. Let's talk now about a, a blessed house. Verse 27, as he was saying these things, a woman from the crowd raised her voice and said, blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. And he said, rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. The evidence that you're filled with the Holy Spirit is that you hear God's word and you keep it. That you hear it and keep it. So you guys are doing great because you're here to hear God's word. We'll see how you do the rest of the week in keeping it, right? So, 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 so this is something we as believers who are filled with God's spirit are eager to know. We are eager to know God's word, not just so that we can know stuff, not just so that we can whip out the right Bible verse at the right time. We are eager to hear these words so that we might obey them. James Edwards writes, he says, discipleship isn't about avoiding habits, but filling the void with Jesus himself. 
Where the kingdom is present, there is no vacancy for other kingdoms, dominions, and lords. I don't, I don't know if any of you have been on a road trip. And I, I don't think this happens as much as it used to, but I, I can tell by the age of some of you, you're at least as old as me, if not older. Uh, before they had, before you had these incredible supercomputers in your pocket where you could make reservations at, uh, you know, with three clicks of a button at a hotel anywhere across the U.S. When you're on a road trip, if you didn't call ahead and didn't know how far you were going to get, you come to a town and they've got these signs that say vacancy or no vacancy. And some of you may have been on a road trip and you, you thought you were going to stop at this place and you pull up and it says no vacancy. There's no room. There's no room in there. And so you got to drive to the next hotel and hope and pray that either the sign's wrong, you know, and there actually is a vacancy even though it says no vacancy, or that there really is vacancy so you have a place to stay, a place to spend the night. I think the idea here in this passage is that there should be no vacancy in our heart because every room should be filled with the Spirit of God. Because we are eager to hear God's word and eager to obey God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we don't want to give the enemy a foothold in either our personal lives or the life of our church or the lives of our family. Would you fill us with the supernatural transforming grace of the Holy Spirit who alone can replace our lust with purity, our worry with trust, our greed with contentment, our anger with patience, our profanity with peace, and our addictions with selfless zeal for the glory of God. Lord, I pray for those who are here this morning or watching at home this morning who are in need of a mighty deliverance. Would you free them? Lord, would you do a wonderful house cleaning in every room of all of our hearts? And I pray as well for those hearing my voice even now who have yet to turn to you as their king. Would you open their eyes that they might behold who you are and what you've done in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ? Would you grant them faith and repentance that they might be with you? We ask this in our precious Savior's name. I'd like to ask our, uh, our worship team to come back up. And uh, if you can turn in your hymnals to number 36, we're going to close this morning by singing Immortal Invisible. Resting on hasty and silent.
birthday today? Um, our sweet Paul had his 19th birthday on Thursday. Yes. And Brad had his birthday on Friday and Brian had his birthday on Saturday. Did anybody else have a birthday this week? We don't want to miss you. Okay, let's sing happy birthday really fast. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday dear Paul and Brad and, and Brad and Brian. Happy birthday to you. So, a uh, couple quick things. Um, if you're new to Tribute Coquini Community Church, welcome. We're thrilled you're here. There's a little, uh, there's a little card, uh, and I'm new here card in the pew in front of you. If you can fill that out, it'll help me remember your name and help us to get to know you better. You can just drop it in the offering box on uh, on your way out. Uh, we also like to eat, so I know there's brownies in the back. I know there's cookies in the back. The Andersons all, make cookies. The yeah. Andersons made cookies. Mm -hmm. So. Um, if, if you're a diabetic, this might not be the There's church for you. There's a banana in the back. No, 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 no I'm kidding, just kidding. But, uh, but in, in all honesty, stay, fellowship, enjoy. Uh, now may the Lord bless you and keep you, may make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, and may he lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace as you go in his grace. God bless you this Sunday. <laughs>